Welcome to Mind Pump. In today's episode, we interview Dr. Stephen Cabral. He goes over some blood tests and saliva tests with Adam, Doug, and Justin. Talks about testing, health, and wellness. You're going to love this episode. Here we go. All right, Dr. Cabral, welcome back. Thanks so much for having me again. Our last episode was awesome. Got a lot of great feedback. You went through some of our hair sample tests. Yes. In today's episode, you're gonna, we did more tests with you. We don't know the results. So we'll get to that uh, in a second. But before we do- Sal's oh, very nervous, buddy. Super he nervous. Very nervous. Shaking. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, you can rank us first, second, third place, like last time. No, but <laughs> um, no I want to talk about uh, the paradigm around preventative health. I know this is something you wanted to kind of talk about a little bit on the show before we got into tests and all that stuff. So let's start there. Let's start about the paradigm around preventative health and where it's at and where it probably needs to go. Yeah, I, I actually thought it was going to shift to an even greater degree over the last two years. You know, with the pandemic, with COVID, I just thought there would be more of a push from mainstream society to say, hey, there's a lot we can do in order to improve our overall health. Like, let's start with good quality nutrition first, get people off the standard American diet, less processed food, less hydrogenated oils, and let's move people to moving their body. It'd just maybe start with seven to 10,000 steps a day, then maybe get into some body, body weight training, then progress up. But it hasn't happened. And that to me is really discouraging because if it's not going to happen over these past two years where we know that you know, the, the ability to be able to not necessarily prevent sickness, but to be able to recover faster. And we know that for sure. Um, I don't think that if, I don't think that it's going to happen unless podcasts like yours and other people are pushing it forward. So it's my mission even more now than ever to be able to say, listen, there's so much that you can do to improve your overall health that you don't need to have the same level of worry. Now there's concern. I understand that, but you don't have to have the same level of worry about getting sick in general. And you can control a lot of these things, even autoimmune issues. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I think there's a couple of reasons why I think there's a challenge there. And I'll start with the first one uh, is I think a lot of people believe that they need to do a lot more than what their maybe schedule allows or maybe what they're willing to do in order to reap benefits. In other words, someone yes. may say, oh, you know, walking, you know, 15 <laughs> minutes a day, like what that's what's that gonna do, even though they're not doing any of that now? Or, oh my God, changing my diet, I have to overhaul everything to notice any results. I mean, maybe talk about that for a second, how small changes you still get some great benefits from, even just the smallest changes. Yeah, and a lot of it, so it's nothing extra. So like the extra in people's day, because I understand how busy everyone is. We're talking about like getting 30 minutes back for yourself a day, like towards your health, towards your fitness. Everybody still has to eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner, or even if you're just doing lunch and dinner, you're still going to have those meals. So now it's more of a one-for-one -one replacement. And when I talk to a lot of people about, if you're making your own food or you think it's difficult, I have no problem in the beginning, people just saying, oh, I'm just going to have some frozen broccoli, you know, ready for me in the uh, freezer. I'm going to have some frozen foods, whatever it might be. You can literally take out a piece of wild frozen salmon, some frozen broccoli, some, if you're, if you're not looking to do rice or grains or anything, some frozen cauliflower, put in the oven, frozen and all, 30 minutes later, you have a meal. You can add a little olive oil, a little sea salt. It's delicious. It's like a gourmet meal for, for no real work. So what I like to do is just share with people, whether you're going out for food or you're eating, we have to make that one-for-one -one switch to have it be healthier. And it also doesn't mean that you can never have a flex meal or a cheat meal or whatever you want to call it. You just have to reach your goals first. Once you reach your goals, I'm sure that you three probably agree, is like you can then enjoy yourself. Like yes. you've, you've reached your goal, so why not have a drink if you choose to or have pasta and bread or whatever it is that you like. And then in terms of exercise, that's that's just that is part of being a human being. I really believe that we are meant to be active and that we put a lot of emphasis on nutrition. But and and I agree with that. But nutrition cannot make up completely what your body is meant to do in terms of physical exercise. Mm. I think it is something that people just greatly overlook that the research clearly shows that simply walking for seven to ten thousand steps a day extends life. Just that. The longest lived people, I agree with weight training, don't get me wrong, but they never did any weight training. Mm -mm. Now they did physical activity. They walked up hills. That was a big thing, you know, with people who live a longer yeah. uh, life. So you, or you're taking the stairs or you're doing these things and they seem like nothing. And here's why they seem like nothing. Eating better for that one meal, walking seven to 10,000 steps a day, that day it does absolutely nothing. Next week it does nothing. Next month it does nothing. Over the course of months and years, it adds up. Yeah, it makes a, um, a tremendous difference. And when you're, you're talking about how we were meant to move and what we're, we're meant to do, here's the second reason why I think people have such trouble with that is that in the past, it, it was a part of culture. It was a part of your life. Now we're in this strange new world where you have to schedule 
exercise or you have to, you have to find time to move. <laughs> and then with nutrition, we ate healthy almost on accident because either A, we didn't have a lot of food, so we didn't overeat. And B, we had to prepare our own food anyway because there weren't, there wasn't a lot of availability. And even today, the cultures that seem to do the best are the ones where exercise is a part of the culture. Like there's certain cultures where walking after a meal is kind of part of the meal. A study just came out that showed there's just a little two minutes of walking post prandial, post meal will reduce uh, the impacts of blood sugar. So I think that's that's a really big one. I think, I think it's more, and I guess this is, I feel this way because I just came off of a, a three day fast that I did. And I'm always, I'm always fascinated in my own behaviors and cravings and the things that I go through during a process like this. And it always blows my mind that when, when I restrict from food for that, that extended period of time, how, uh, I mean, like the, the most simplest foods sound amazing. And I feel like we, we have just oversaturated our bodies and we're so spoiled that we can have access to so much all the time that what drives us that make our decisions is these these explosions we want in our mouth and if we could just pull back a little bit and restrict for a little bit and maybe not give ourselves food for a while and actually truly feel what it feels like to feel hungry a little bit it's amazing actually what sounds good yeah. like I'm, i remember just being like oh my god i just want a brussels sprout right now i hated brussels sprouts growing up but it was just like just something nutritious i wanted any a piece of chicken sounded so amazing are you familiar with any research around that around the de i don't know for lack of a better term desensitizing ourselves to perceiving flavors because heavily processed foods are just, they just bombard us with so much. Yeah. Is there any evidence that, cause I mean, I've experienced it and a lot of people have, but do you, do you know of any? Yeah. And there's, there's actually a really good book on it. It will, these are the three words of the book. It's basically, um, sugar, salt, fat. Yes. I know um, that book, that's yeah. not the name of it. It's close to that. Yes. And it talks about the, the biochemicals in your body. So basically it's called the neurotransmitters that are actually released when we eat these foods. So we know that one of the biggest, um, reasons for addiction in general, and that can include alcohol, uh, is to produce more dopamine. Mm. And that gives you that, that fix and it lasts for a little bit, but then it drops. And what they found is that maybe when you eat those carbs, that processed food or whatever it might be, blood sugar can raise and then it, it comes back down to baseline. And if your body's healthy, it will just stay at baseline. But dopamine actually dips lower than when you had that, that sugary food er, uh, previous to that. So that means that that neurochemical for reward actually goes higher every mm. time you have that cheat, which is technically why some people do so much better with no cheat meals or flex meals in their diet. Because once they have that one, it can actually set off their neurotransmitters in an unbalanced way. Now, some people, it's because of gut health bit disorders. So when you put that um, extra fructose from alcohol or processed carbs into your gut, it's starting to feed the candida and it's starting to feed the SIBO, the small intestine bacterial overgrowth. So then you take it away and there's a greater craving because these are actually living things. Um, but back to your point. So I'm actually doing my fall functional medicine detox right now. And the first two days of that are liquid fasting. It's almost no calories. It's just the micronutrients to keep up liver detoxification. Because we live in a more toxic world, which just means that there's more plastics, phthalates, everything coming into us at all times. Exhaust fumes, we talked about that on the last show. So these micronutrients just help to basically give you that phase one and phase two liver detox. But by the time day three comes and it's lunchtime, it's it just your interest in food is so great that you're happy to be eating yes. a salad yes. or vegetables or whatever. And it's a resetting of the system. And I think that, that it's absolutely amazing. But there's one other part to it. Humans are meant to do hard things and our lives have got soft. They really have, like mine included. You know, like I can be in air conditioned all day. The temperature can always be at 70 degrees, like all the time. I can take an Uber here instead of having to walk a mile like you were just talking about, mm -hmm. Sal. The exercise, you're right. We didn't have to think about walking because, well, we walked or we did manual labor. And not even 100 years ago, there wasn't refrigeration to the degree that there is now. So none of these things even existed three generations really previous to us. And as humans, we have to start actually doing hard things to build up a callus, a hermetic stressor, so that real stresses in our life, then they actually feel stressful. Not the easy things, not the things that maybe we shouldn't be all stressed out about. What's up, everybody? Today's giveaway is MAPS Split. This is a bodybuilder split routine done the MAPS way, the right way. You can get it for free. Here's how you win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. Do all of those things. If we like your comment we and we pick it, we'll notify you in the comment section that you won free access to MAPS Split. Also, we got a sale going on right now. The Skinny Guy Bundle 
50% off, and the Fit Mom Bundle, 50% off. So if you want to get signed up for either one, click on the link at the top of the description below to get the 50% off discount. All right, here comes the show. You mentioned the change in temperature, and uh, I've noticed that just anecdotally. If if there's like a dramatic shift in, in say, the weather or like the environment that I'm in, uh, typically if there's anything floating around, I'm a little bit more susceptible to, to catching it. Mm -hmm. Is there any, like, have you gone through any of the, the studies or science like kind of like in that direction? Yeah, and the best studies of those are actually on heat or cold-based therapy. Mm. So there's sauna, right? So if we, my I have, I have two different types of sauna. So I have an infrared sauna and then I have a barrel sauna. My barrel sauna, I can crank up to 200 degrees. Now, just 200 degrees, it's a six-foot sauna. So if I put my head to the ceiling, it's 200 degrees and it's insanely hot. But when you're seated, it's somewhere around like 100. 70, 180. So it's still obviously very, very hot. And you're not really meant to be in that for more than 20, 30 minutes. I know some people try to like mm. make it a competition, but you have to be you know, careful with things like that. But you can actually um, test the blood before and after. And when you test the blood after you've been in that sauna for about 30 minutes, it, it looks like an absolute war zone, your blood. It, it looks terrible. But what happens is your body is reacting to that stress and it's actually getting stronger. That includes your immune cells. That includes your, uh, it's called your HPA axis, your hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. So you start to produce more amounts of norepinephrine or normal amounts of norepinephrine as well as cortisol. So a lot of people with depression and anxiety, uh, low mood-based disorders, we'll say, actually get tremendous benefit from heat therapy as well as cold therapy. Oh, interesting. Because mm -hmm. they produce yeah. oftentimes less dopamine and less norepinephrine. Two things that you get a surge of whenever you do those, those two modalities. Yeah, I, I use that yeah. example with exercise when people talk about, um, when they take a study that looked at one metric, like, uh oh, these inflammatory markers went up or this one thing That's went right. down. I'm like, man, if you did a blood test on someone post-workout, mm -hmm. oh, it would it look terrible. Unhealthy, Nobody yes. would yeah. want to work out because it looked like this is a pro-inflammatory cancer causing, you know, death, you know, causing activity when in reality what it does is it, strengthens and, and improves our health. You know, back to the perception of, of taste, we've talked about this on the show. I had a, I've had clients where these were people who had terrible diets, they didn't exercise, they hire me, and they drank diet sodas because they preferred the flavor of diet sodas to regular sodas. In fact, regular sodas weren't sweet enough. And I know that artificial sweeteners are, I mean, gram per gram, far sweeter than sugar. My uh, observation or my guess is that it changed their perception of all sweetness. Maybe there was a downregulation of receptors, or maybe they don't get the same dopamine hit. Have you experienced this with any patients? Uh, without a doubt, I don't know the exact science between. Uh, I know what you're talking about in terms of sweetness. Like even stevia is 300 times sweeter yeah. than sugar, and so it's not that. And I have no problem with people using stevia. People like to say, "Well, it you know causes this, causes that." I haven't really seen that. Not mm -hmm. of only have I not seen in practice in 15 years, I haven't really seen in the research. If anything, it looks like the stevia sides actually help with the gut microbiome and potentially even Lyme disease. Mm. So I don't, you know, monk fruit, stevia, I'm totally fine with those. Um, but I'm also just as okay with some organic maple syrup or some raw honey and just a smaller amount because it is the natural sugar. It's a natural amount of sweetness that we may get. Um, and, and I'm much more of an advocate of that than something like aspartame, which people say, oh, it's no big deal. Um, studies say it's okay. So, well, okay. Studies say it's okay for a fraction of the dose and in a certain population. But I can show you people where who have autism or have chemical sensitivities that that creates massive issues with what's called glutamate or glutamic acid mm -hmm. in their body, like without a doubt. Like cytotoxin, right? Cyto it, well, a a cytotoxin in the way that for them, they can't break it down properly. Right. So some people can literally not metabolize that as other people. You even see it in children. So some kids do totally fine with things that have uh, artificial flavors, natural flavors. They don't, doesn't really change their mood. You give it to another kid, they're off the wall. They're literally um, hitting other kids. And, and that's why I think we need to look into that more for ADD, ADHD, because their body can't metabolize that glutamate. And so like if, even taking glutamine, so glutamine is a phenomenal nutritional supplement, can help with um, recovery from workouts, muscle mass. It can help with, uh, it helps with burn victims. It helps with um, HIV, keeps muscle in the body, essentially mm -hmm. makes you more anabolic. Most abundant amino acid in, in skeletal muscle, correct? hundred percent. It's okay. one of the first ones besides um, zinc and vitamin C gets depleted during stress. But some people, when they put a higher amount of glutamine, like 10 grams plus a day, they can't properly metabolize that glutamine which does eventually break down to glutamic acid. Mm. So that's why we're always looking at the bioindividuality of the person. 
Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but I'm not an advocate whatsoever of artificial sweeteners, even if people are saying the studies yeah. are okay. I have a nephew where the, some certain dyes will really trigger some of his, you know, he's, he's got, he's neurodivergent. So ADD ish, ADHD. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I don't remember what color dyes, but I mean, it's a profound effect and they've, they've talked about this. This is not, I'm not, you know, this isn't just him. Yes. This is actually a kind of a, a known thing. What role, because I've seen studies, and there's some scientists that'll do this to kind of try to prove a point, although I get what they're saying, but I also disagree, is they'll show, well, all these negative effects of sugar, all these negative effects of certain foods, when the calories are low enough, then we still see improvements in health. Like what role does just eating too much play in poor health? Without a doubt, that's a factor. Okay. So um, you, you can look at it a couple other ways. So like when I go back to the rain barrel effect, right? So there's a lot of people who can eat the same exact foods that they always eat when they typically have a reaction if they fast for the majority of the day. And why? It, it literally goes back to the rain barrel effect. So mm. they're emptying their rain barrel for 16 hours, 18 hours, 20 hours. And then they have that one meal, which contains gluten or hydrogenated oils or, or chemicals or whatever they typically have. But their body right now is at a cleaner slate. And now it's ready to be able to process inside of the liver, the kidneys, the immune cells. So it doesn't overwhelm them. So it doesn't overwhelm. It doesn't overflow that rain barrel. Interesting. Yeah. But now that, but that to me, that's conventional medicine in a nutshell. It's a band-aid based approach and it's not looking at the root cause as to why. And it's also not looking at bioindividuality. Mm -hmm. It's also not looking at reality. Who the hell eats in a caloric deficit all the time? Nobody. I mean, and those foods the, can contribute to behaviors that make you. Yeah, and the re the reality yeah. is that even with the people that go on great diets and keep themselves in check, like you're, you're gonna over, you're gonna over, you're gonna overfill the rain barrel eventually. And eventually, you're going to always go back to what you would consider like a normal or average diet. Yeah. So I have no problem with people doing a 21 day reset or you know maybe up to six weeks but there has to be a plan that takes you from whatever that uh you know really stressful 21 days is to then less stressful call mm -hmm. it a phase two to then a phase three which you're eating all the time every day except for your one or two flex meals per week that is the way that people are going to be able to maintain their health anybody i know who's in great shape great health all of the greats mentally as well mood wise they are enjoying themselves once or twice a week but they're doing the other things in order to be able to earn that yeah food. Yeah. So now that I have you here, I've been wanting to ask you, this is a little bit of a, a turn, but um, I, um, um, I've i been reading about antioxidants, uh, in, in particular, um, some of the ones that are most important uh, for the liver. I know you could mm -hmm. take a supplement NAC, which will raise, um, what's the thing that it raises? Glutathione. In the glutathione. Yeah. You could also supplement glutathione, which helps the liver. This was because during the pandemic, there were some studies that showed that low glutathione levels was strongly connected to poor outcomes with uh, with COVID. But I also read that taking too many or too much of like glutathione, for example, could cause also an adverse effect. You could have too many antioxidants. You could go in the opposite direction. Yes. What does that look like? And is there a huge individual variance with that? So it's, it's almost impossible to create an antioxidant overload on the body if it's coming from food. Right. So the body will that always be able to process that, use what it needs, and then get rid of it. The problem is it's not building up those reserves. Mm. So it's, you have to get it on a daily basis or near daily basis. So uh, if we take a step back, so antioxidants are needed because oxidation and oxidative stress continue to build up on the body the more that we do and the older that we get. So that's why when you do sauna, when you do cold plunge, when you do hard workouts, uh, when you fast, these are just some of the things that we're doing, like as I don't want to call them, you know, biohacks, but these are things that we're doing and we know more about to keep ourselves healthy. The problem is all of those things, inclu including breathing and eating, cause oxidative stress in the body, which means it creates free radicals. Mm. So we're missing those oxygen-based molecules. We're missing those electrons. We need antioxidants. That's the difficult part about saying, carnivore-only diet, uh, keto-only diet, because we're missing, unless you are getting all vegetables to stand to your carb load for the day, which you could do, um, you're not going to get those antioxidant loads. So just to go back then to glutathione, glutathione is what we call the, the master antioxidant. That's what we're looking to produce. The body produces it endogenously. It just needs the raw material in order to be able to do it. 
And so phase one of liver detox is typically your vitamins and minerals. So you're looking at like zinc and selenium, which is also used in phase two, all of your B vitamins, like folate, B12, the mm -hmm. methylated forms uh, and glutamine. And then the second phase is from sulfur-based amino acids. You talked about N-acetylcysteine, there's taurine, there's a bunch of others that also then help to create glutathione. Got it. So there's the um, first pathway and the second pathway, the second pathway is which people are typically missing. Like if you take a good methylated daily activated multi or something like that, you're covered on phase one, mm -hmm. but very few of them cover you in the sulfur based ones, which come from cruciferous vegetables. So the Brussels sprouts, the broccoli, the bok choy, those types of things give you the sulfur based, um, and even garlic items like that. And then they make glutathione glutathione unless you're taking it intravenously, uh, which then you could definitely overdo it, is difficult to be able to absorb in the body right now. You can take mm -hmm. reduced glutathione or liposomal glutathione, um, but it's almost better. We've seen a lot of great results with using N-acetylcysteine, yeah. NAC, as the precursor. It's funny because I'm pretty sure they know this because Amazon banned NAC. I know. Uh, they're now seeming to allow it back potentially. Well, the FDA said that they were going to take it off the market. That's right. Yeah, which was kind of interesting timing. Yes. Mm. Very interesting. <laughs> Peculiar because it's been out a long time. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Very interesting. All right. So what we did with you, the tests that we did with you were blood and saliva tests. And yes. for the audience, um, this was an at-home test. So we got a kit. Uh, you take it home. There were some um, vials that you fill with saliva or you fill to a certain point with saliva. And then there was a blood test where you prick your finger and you, you I don't remember how many drops of blood. It was something like 15 or something like that, drops of blood. And then we send it into the lab. That one took a lot of effort. Yeah. To it's milk. Just, <laughs> <excuse me. laughs> like milk in my well, finger. I didn't have the, the, the nurse advice until later on. Yeah. I, you, I Warm up your finger? No. She, all the stuff that Justin said, like, we should have done to actually get the blood out. Really? Like, yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Courtney told him, like, where are you, uh, where are you even prick it? And, oh, you know, interesting. Yeah. And then I even, like, I noticed a huge difference by uh, coming from your elbow and coming mm -hmm. down. Like, that. Oh, maybe, interesting. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so we did I learned that. a lot on that test. We <laughs> give all the tips today. So, <laughs> We sent them in. Now, what are these tests looking at? What's the saliva test looking for? Mm -hmm. And what's the blood test looking for? Yeah, and it's, and it's good to differentiate between the two. So saliva is the absolute best lab test to find out your hormone levels. Now, you can do hormone through blood. Like you can take your testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, uh, et cetera, through blood. And there's nothing wrong with that. You just always want to run the free form of something like testosterone. Because in the blood, about 95 to 99% of hormone in the blood is bound up by protein. And so you don't actually know if that's able to be used or not if you're just running total testosterone. So like sex binding uh, hormone sex globulin. hormone binding globulin. Okay. Yep. So sex hormone binding globulin is increased actually with oxidative stress. Mm. And that could be from heavy metals. It could be from gut inflammation. It could be from mental, physical, emotional stress, uh, overdoing your workouts without recovery. Any one of those things can increase uh, SHGB, sex okay. hormone uh, binding globulin, BG. Yep. Now, I, I just recently... Uh, you shared with you that I did a three day fast. This was after we did all the testing. It was actually just a, a little over a week and a half ago. How much would my test be different had I tested right after that? Do you mm -hmm. can would it be significantly different, a little bit different, or would nothing be different if if we would have tested me like right after I did like a three day fast? Yeah. So there's there's um, two scenarios based on the constitution and strength of the person's body when they did that lab. So if someone has a really strong, healthy, robust body your body will boost testosterone, it will boost DHEA, and it will boost cortisol. So it's putting you in the beginning of like adrenal-based stress. On a, in, a, in a post fat, like right after the right fat. Right after. Right? Oh, interesting. And the reason it is, is like you're, you're in that alpha state where yeah. you need to go find food, you need to go out there and whatever's challenging you, but that only lasts for so long. Growth hormone and these hormones begin to drop after about 72 hours. Okay. So after that, you're in a much more catabolic state. Yeah, that's why after. That's why in a fast, some people, I mean, me included, I'm energized. I feel sharper. Yeah, no, I felt great. In. But I remember one of my concerns because I was doing this fast. I was also fasting from sex, and right after the fast was when Katrina would be most likely to get pregnant. One of my concerns was, boy, maybe I didn't time that food fast very well, like because I'd be low on nutrients. Maybe my testosterone levels would naturally dip, but you're saying that it actually probably would have spiked. Oh, it depends on the individual because someone who though is already in an exhausted, burnt out state yeah. drives their testosterone lower. Yeah, like it God. depletes you. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and what effect would that have on like sperm? Huh? So not as much. Time, probably yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Not yeah. as much. Okay. Now, so that was your libido could decrease though. Yeah. yeah. So that, so the saliva test was for hormones. Yes. And I noticed we did several of them. So you're looking at hormone levels throughout the day, right? That's not right. just a, not just a, a screenshot. Mm. That's the important thing. And, and you'll see it on all of your labs today. And this is why it's so important. 
when you go and have your, let's say you have your blood work run with your PCP, it should always be before 10 a.m. Yeah. You really want it fasted and before 10 a.m. to look at your lipid panel for your cholesterol and all these numbers. But your hormones, especially testosterone, is really going to be highest in the morning. Your estrogen, all, all these numbers, although th that is diurnal as well. So when we're looking at these, we're looking at um, all of your hormones for the first tube, which is a larger tube. That's the one you take upon waking or within mm -hmm. the first 20 minutes. And we're looking at that for our cortisol, but our testosterone, DHEA, which is a precursor to testosterone. It's an important number that we talk about here today because the better your DHEA, the better your immune system typically. Mm -hmm. So it's a really important number and it decreases with age, which is why our immune system typically weakens with age. And then we look at progesterone and estrogen and that goes for men and women. Um, and the reason is, is that men can start to convert too much testosterone to estrogen and that has negative effects as well. And then before lunch, you're gonna do a small tube of saliva, then before dinner, small tube of saliva, and then before bed. And the reason is that cortisol works on what's called the diurnal rhythm. That means it's basically two parts to it. So it should be a cortisol awakening response about 20 to 30 minutes after you wake should be peak cortisol, somewhere between six and eight in the morning, ideally. But you can change yours depending on when you wake up. Um, and then after that, it just starts to drop throughout the day. And it should be at its lowest point at around 9.30 or so at night. And if it's not, then your body is most likely not getting the deep sleep that it requires, the REM sleep that it requires, and you're not getting the recovery, which then leads to lower testosterone, lower, lower DHE over time. Okay. So when we go through our labs, I want you to challenge each of us when you get to something that's like off on the charts. Sure. Yeah. On if, we, so when you're doing, let's say when you're doing Justin and let's say DHEA or something you're going over, I want you to ask him, do you do you think you're higher than the rest of the guys or lower than the rest of the guys? I want to see how well we <laughs> sure. know ourselves. No, I, yeah. bet, I think I think that we'll all know each other and ourselves pretty yeah. well. And I'm and I'll Maybe. be interested. And, yeah, and we'll by see. the end, I you'll you'll have absolutely be you'll be able to predict the future. So my goal with this at home lab testing is that everyone learns how to read their own labs. Oh, yeah. I, I do love case that. studies cool. twice a month and all my podcasts try to do things that just teaches people. I want you to be able to pick up this lab and know how to read it. Now you don't have to be the expert. But you should absolutely know how to. I love that. Like if they've been going through your workouts, yeah, guys, girls in this program uh, for years, they should know how to put together a program. Yeah. Now they go to you because you're still the best at what you do, mm -hmm. yeah. but they should be able to know how to structure a program. For themselves, at least. No, that's, that's right. right. I mean, that's yeah. part of that's our, what that's we always been our mission yeah. for sure. So that's the whole, that's the saliva test. Now, what yes. are the blood tests? We're looking with the blood drops. So, and it's important too because saliva cannot accurately test everything. And that's why we always look at, are we looking at here? Okay, that shows excretion of the body. Saliva, it shows what's usable. That's the hormones, the sex hormones we're looking at. Okay. Blood, we're looking at capillary blood. And so with this, you cannot look at your thyroid through saliva. So we have to do the blood spot. Now, for mm -hmm. people at home that have never done this, like how can you get blood at home? You're doing the same thing that you would use for a finger stick for type 2 diabetes, just to get your glucose. Mm -hmm. So you do a small finger prick, and we could give you the tips today how to make that super easy. Uh, you can, standing is one thing and warming up the hands, all those things. And then you're putting that on the card. It's going to give you not just your TSH, which is typically what your PCP is going to run. That's thyroid stimulating hormone. doesn't tell you anything. just tells you the amount of stress the thyroid is under to produce more or less thyroid. Then just like free testosterone, we want to look at T3. That's the most important one. That's the that's active. The, that's the most active. Exactly. Okay. It will show T4, show T3 so we can see if there's any breaks in the links. And then um, we also look at TPO antibodies. And then the final part of the test that has to be done in blood, again, this is the finger prick, uh, is your hemoglobin A1C. It's basically a weighted average over the last 90 days of what mm. your blood sugar looks like. And then there's insulin, which is that moment in time. Uh, what does your insulin spike look like? Mm. What mm. was that one you said? TPO3? TPO antibodies. Antibody. What are those? Um, so your body will produce antibodies based on subtype of autoimmune-based process. And um, unlike, let's say, RA for rheumatoid factor for oh. rheumatoid arthritis, TPO is the antibodies produced that attack the thyroid. And so there's a lot of Hashimoto's. Got uh, it. One out of eight women mm -hmm. um, are dealing with low thyroid. So you could have theoretically normal looking thyroid labs, but mm -hmm. then have such high antibodies that your body's not utilizing it right. And you could be having th th low thyroid symptoms. Is that correct? It, yes. But by the time you typically get to, so we, we hope to do more preventative based health. Got it. So when we see that TSH getting above a two, so TSH should be a 0.5 to a two. Got it. But at your, when you go to your, your typical lab visit, and again, people might have the best PCP in the world and that's fantastic. That That's great. Just most are not trained in this. Usually the marker goes to a five. By the time you get to a five for TSH, your your thyroid's been uh, defective and dysfunctional for years. Most oh, likely. wow. So then your TPO antibodies could start reacting um, from 
90% of all autoimmune issues now are tied to the gut. They, they can see that. Stress is related, but gut is a big part of it. Heavy metals can be it, infections, viruses. So there's other factors, but um, this was actually a, a study that I just shared, and it was uh, it was either Mayo Clinic or, or Harvard um, said that Hashimoto's specifically tied to increased gut permeability. Now, 30 years ago, not quite 30 years, when, when I had my illnesses, you were laughed out of the doctor's office. Oh, yeah. Leaky, leaky gut, gut syndrome. You said yeah. that, and they were like, oh, God. Fibromyalgia, leaky yeah. gut, uh, you know, adrenal fatigue. Adrenal like, fatigue. Yeah. you know, what's, now, what's wrong with this yeah. person? Now there's a medical term for it. You said it, intestinal, That's, you know, hyperpermeability, which exactly, I think is yes. absolutely hilarious. Okay, so question around gut, the, the gut. You said that 90% or so of autoimmune issues connect to the gut, mm -hmm. and you talked about stress. I know that stress can also affect the gut, and the gut can also affect your stress right. levels. So uh, do we know what like what affects what more, or is it just this two-way street? So you can't affect, you can't look at one without looking at the other. That's right. And so that's why people say like, if I can only work on one thing, if you could only do one thing in your practice, what would it be? And I always say, well, I can't do one, but I can do, if you give me two, uh -huh. then I could fix Got and it. help fix 90% of, of most people. And that's stress and it's gut. And we don't always know what comes first. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. So it's called neuroendoimmunology. And it's something that I love to study. It's how the nervous system, so our, our peripheral stress, so it could be stress from the outside world or inside world, inside of our brain, affects our um, hormones. So you'll see today a rise in cortisol, which is a stress hormone, right? So good in the short term, it's also powerful anti-inflammatory, bad in the long term in terms of chronic stress in the body and causing gut-based permeability. And then the immunology, people say, well, you know, I don't have any digestive issues. So what's the issue? Well, the issue is maybe candida overgrowth, maybe SIBO, the bacterial overgrowth, maybe parasites, maybe H. pylori. But what happens is um, the gut wall is basically a single cell. It's hard to imagine, but it's a single cell only allowing the good stuff to come into the bloodstream, uh, your amino acids, your glucose molecules, your fatty acids, et cetera, and the bad stuff out. But what happens is that becomes more permeable. I know we've talked about this before in the show. And that is then if you have 80% of your immune cells right around the gut lining in and outside of the gut, well, that's what sets off the immune system. And then that's when genetics matters. Mm. So you know, back in the day, I had Addison's disease, I had rheumatoid arthritis, I had type 2 diabetes, I had all these issues. I don't have any of them now, but I had the same genetics. So I didn't have it at 8 years old, had it at 17 years old, don't have it now 25 plus years later. Well, why is it same genetics? Because I don't have the gut permeability. Mm -hmm. I've worked on my stress to a massive level to be able to, you know, control that. And um, so you, people can heal. I mean, they really can. Interesting. All right. So the uh, I want to ask you about the blood brain barrier, because um, when I first started learning about the blood brain barrier, it was communicated that it was like this impermeable wall. There was no, nothing got right. to the brain that, you know, the gut didn't communicate with the brain, nothing. Other brain. And then recently we found that there were some direct connections between the brain and the gut. And I can't remember the, the, what these connections were, what they found, but how about how the brain is affected by all of this and how that affects your I guess your behavior is a psychology. That's right. So gut brain axis is okay. what it's been termed. And looking at your gut is actually your second brain. So a lot of the, some of the, you know, the buzz quotes that are thrown out there as well, 90% of all the serotonin in your body is made and produced in your gut, right. which is true. But like, it's also overlooking the manufacturing of vitamin B12 from certain bacteria in your gut and the, and the jejunum and other parts of the actual digestive system. So the problem is when we don't have enough of these neurotransmitters and neurochemicals, we aren't able to produce the mind and mood that we want. But at the same time, a lot of people have massive levels of inflammation in their digestive system. I mean, if we look at our digestive system, it's about 26 feet. And when we have inflammation in our gut, we can't tell, we're not able to tell ourselves that there's something wrong in our gut. So we get signals of irritability, mm -hmm. of anxiety, mm -hmm. of overwhelm, of not feeling well. None of that affects all of our life and how it affects our life because then we take different actions. We don't have the same energy. So we start to fall behind in everything else that we're looking to do in our life. Like if you feel terrible, you don't want to exercise. If you feel terrible, you just want comfort food. You don't want to make food. You don't want to go out of your way to do these things. So it's really a, a two-way street. Yeah. I, now, is it true that the heart is the third uh, has some of the, th maybe the third highest serotonin receptors. I think it was the brain, the gut, and then the heart. Is that true? I don't know that. Okay. No. I, I do find it interesting though that for thousands of years, yeah. uh, that before we knew all this, we would think, we would say things like, listen to your gut or I feel it in my gut. Uh, which kind of leads me in this direction. Yeah, which which yeah. kind of points to the fact that you know that it is a second brain, if you will. And I think it is well beyond serotonin and these chemicals. I actually so the enteric nervous system is is essentially what we're talking about around the gut. And and if you look, have you ever looked into Heart Math Institute? No, mm -hmm. very interesting. 
heart yeah, really interesting. Stuff, it sounds yeah. interesting. They actually study the resonance of the heart. Oh. Like the electric, because your heart That's is electrical. Right. Uh, I have not gone as deep as I would like to with that, but I find it very interesting. Um, and then the same with the gut. I actually think that, well, in if you look at traditional Chinese medicine, you look at other forms of medicine, and again, I don't necessarily go down this path, but they believe every organ has its own um, I don't want to say the word feeling, but let's just say electrical charge and feeling inside of the body. Like the liver can, when something's wrong with it, yeah. there's more anger, there's more irritability. Yes. Again, it's more of a meridian based thing in traditional Chinese medicine rather than the actual organ itself. But I find it fascinating. And I, and I truly believe, although it's not what I do, I believe that the future of medicine, we're talking about maybe hundreds of years from now, will be more energetic in nature. I, I, I don't agree. know what that looks like. I just don't. Yeah. I just believe that it is. I, I agree, and, and the, the verbiage oh, and language they use, yeah. the language they use is what turns off Western medicine right. people, right? right. Like yes. they say your chi and your energy and all that. I remember mm -hmm. I had a doctor, a, a surgeon client, and we were talking about acupressure or sorry, acupuncture, and there were studies that were showing it was efficacious for mm -hmm. especially for pain, and and I'm like, how can this be? And this and that. And we're going back, and I said, you know, the nervous system is very interesting. I mean, they use a word like like chi. But we know that when you have pain in your left arm or when you feel pain in a particular area, it's corresponding to a particular organ. And he agreed with me. He goes, yeah, I think that's probably what – they just had different verbiage. They didn't say nervous 100%. system. They said, Doug, they said, can yeah. you actually uh, look up heart math and write down some names? I would love to interview. That would be such a fun interview. Though. Yeah, that sounds, really cool. That's really interesting. All right, yeah. so let's get into these tests. So we all sent you or we sent the labs uh, saliva – and blood tests. I know that my saliva test got rejected because I didn't have enough saliva or something. Do we want to tell everybody how, what really happened? You ain't yeah. spitting good game <laughs> so, there, buddy. What's the, what's the truth behind this? Yeah. Doug won't let So you shit. just have blood for me, <laughs> yeah. uh, but everybody else has saliva and blood, so maybe we can kind of go through that. So you bit. automatically lose, but contaminated well, with yeah, and now, now, and for, so for the audience, second last Now place. for the audience, we do not know these results at all. That's it's right. literally yes. you're telling us first time here. Yeah. Now we can edit out what we don't want. So, <laughs> and, and, and I don't want to take the wind out of uh, your sales, but we don't have any of your specific numbers okay yeah oh nothing so, uh, nothing oh yeah. wow oh, I know. way to wow. go wow. big loser this today <laughs> well, hey, that, gives you guys, that gives you guys a chance to look healthier <laughs> they, for they a get second it, oh. <laughs> get a big <laughs> asterisk there yeah, right? i know so we'll, we'll do this we'll do a part two i'll, I'll give you your follow-up oh, for sure yeah. okay um so yeah i have uh if we can go through it we'll go through <laughs> doug's uh then justin's then adam's okay. and uh in this specific order for for a reason oh, but um oh, i also God. don't all that shit talking adam i'm getting sandwiched here usually we do an intake i i don't have yours i actually enjoy doing it like this because I, I don't know necessarily uh, what any symptoms you might be feeling. No, or I, think, I think that's why the so audience it's, it's I think that's why the audience liked it so much yeah. is because we have no idea. You yeah. got very limited information about you just us. Have your data. Yeah, yeah, so that you yeah. get to people get to hear us yeah. work it out. And that's well, why I want you to challenge each of us individually because I bet, I mean, I hope we're pretty in tune with what we've Or know, maybe ask the other guys about the other guy. Yeah. Well, but. both. You can, we can all answer, right? So. You, can, you can be the, the judge, Sal, if you want. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, that's Wait, my favorite please. position. <laughs> um, so what I think a good one would be, yeah, who who um who has the highest levels of stress? Uh, uh -huh. You know, and, like looking at that, I think yeah. that would be great to look at. Doug. Well, last time it was Doug. Right. It still yeah. is Doug. Yeah. And it can't be. Champion. Yeah. 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 The winner of that, for sure. Yeah. Stress king. Yeah, yeah. He's a stress king. I would actually say Doug, Justin, Myself and Sal, or Sal, Sal and I will be close, but you don't have Sal's. But yeah, I, I would think it would be that order. I mean, I got a lot of kids, man. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. <laughs> oh, yeah. You <laughs> you know, one of the me there. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Yeah. All right. So on Doug's first, um, just for people who are not maybe seeing this on video, and, and I can, uh, you know, pop this up as well. Uh, Doug, why don't I actually give you this? If you okay. Want to Thank you. Um, it, how this lab is run is basically it goes red, yellow, green, yellow, red for the bar. So if you look at a bar graph, you want to be within the green, ideally. If you're in the yellow, it says, okay, you're suboptimal. We can work on that. And if you're in the red, it means, okay, we've got some work to do. And of course, they'll give you an H for high or an L for low. Okay. So um, Doug, when we're looking at yours, let me just put yours on my laptop here. And um, we want to look first at estrogen. So normal estrogen levels, we're just going to talk about uh, men here for today. Again, the lab will give you the specific range. And again, the labs that we're using are all what's called CLIA certified. That means these labs uh, follow things by the book. Uh, there's privacy policies. Your lab results are not shared with health insurance. They're not shared with um, your PCP unless you want to, which is really nice because... Um, health insurance is doing some really strange things now if they know your genetics, if they know other factors. Yeah. So it's better to keep these things private. So nobody can see this unless you want them to. That's right. Oh, so that's it's great. just um, our team, which is HIPAA compliant, mm -hmm. the lab itself, which is HIPAA compliant, and then the, the patient or wellness client. Beautiful. Yep. Okay. Okay. So on our estrogen levels, for men, we want it to be between a 0.5 and a 1.2. That's our goal. 
So when we're looking at uh, Doug's, we are looking at a 1.6 for estradiol, which is the main <clears throat> excuse me, form of estrogen. So we have a little higher level of estrogen that we would like. One of the reasons why uh, men will convert more testosterone, because what happens is it goes cholesterol to pregnenolone to dihydroepiandosterone, which is DHEA, to testosterone to estrogen. That's basically the flow chart. Okay. Could having a little white poodle dog play into that at all? <laughs> Stupid dude. <laughs> <laughs> Not a poodle. I'm going to have to go back and it's research a that. <laughs> yeah, get it right. Yeah. It's a Maltese. Right. I'll, I'll, Maltese, I'll refrain from commenting right now. Hey, you got, your tests are last, bro. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I got to talk shit now because I, I already know the way he set it up. I'm going to get it. So <laughs> let me have my minute, bro. <laughs> oh, that's funny. So a little higher than we want. Um, and, and we'll talk about that with, with different symptoms that could be. Progesterone, uh, we want that under a 50. You're at a 37, Doug, so that looks great. Testosterone is on the lower side. It's a 42. I For, have a question on that. Yeah, Because absolutely. I've done uh, labs, blood labs, yes. and every quarter. And I actually have my lab results uh, pulled up. And last uh, time it was at 939. Yes, and which then, is your total testosterone. Total testosterone. Well, yep. And the one prior to that was 1086. What was your yes. free, Doug? Because they'll measure well, your free. Well, it was 10. It was 10 uh, out of a 7.2 to 24 range. So it was low. Mm -hmm. And I know my sex binding hormone globulin or sex hormone binding globulin yes. is elevated. So that I'm very curious why these different numbers seem so different. They actually say the same exact thing. Oh, do they? Okay. Yeah, this is the free yeah. testosterone. Yeah, he just oh, this it. is a free Yeah, you said 10. He said nine. Right? Saliva right. doesn't oh, measure. God, yeah, same, so they're, they're like it's, it's, and that's why I like to do these because so what I do with every lab that I run is I actually have my blood work done. And then I run this lab while I'm having my blood work. Compare the two. To compare the two. Oh, beautiful. And so, and this is, um, I mean, this is the premier uh, at home lab. But what you're what you're saying is a really good question. So basically, this is a a really good um, case study of your testosterone levels. Total testosterone is okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd like it a little bit higher, but not bad at all. But what's happening is your testosterone is being bound up. Okay, because of what well, I'm about to show you in a second, and mm -hmm. then it's also converting to estrogen. Okay. So it's not staying where it should as free testosterone. Okay. So my goal, so when we look at age-wise, I want you at an 85, so basically double where you are, to 100. And that would be totally normal and natural. And so we, we need to do things in order to get you there. But the things that we do are not necessarily supplemental in nature. We can do some of that. But actually, to reduce this next thing, which we're going to talk about, which is cortisol. Okay. Right? Uh -huh. um, but it's a good question, and, it, and they actually <laughs> say the same exact thing. Now, um, I'll get to the DHEA. The, the interesting thing is this. You do have a strong uh, body because your DHEA is a 7.9. Typically, when I see testosterone this low, DHEA is below a 4. Mm. And so your DHEA is still a 7.9, almost 8. And- um, that should not be holding as strong as it is unless you were healthy and taking care of yourself because your cortisol now, so all four, if I can just give a quick synopsis, are in the red. Mm. So that means they're all high mm. all day long. Mm. So you're producing high cortisol upon waking, high at noon, high at evening, and the worst one's actually before bed. Wow. Oh, that's wow. usually when you're so working the most, That's affecting right? then your When you get sleep. off the phone with Adam, probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Stop Gosh, talking to him. Stop talking I had to write a <laughs> little doctor's note today to <laughs> get out of those Avoid late Adam meetings. for the next two days, please. <laughs> um, so what this is, though, because this is the sleep mode. <laughs> like midnight. Did you really? <laughs> yeah. I was oh. talking about revenue at midnight. Oh, my God, Doug. This is no right wonder I'm in the test. red zone. <laughs> I literally was like, hey, revenue's been awfully low this last week. Is <laughs> no. it me? Yeah, is it midnight? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Hey, I was up though. Right? Yeah, <laughs> I know you are. That's the only reason why I said it. I know. I know you're up too because you're yeah, 1.5 for your cortisol, which means your mind is not able to shut off. Ah, and that's the big thing. So the problem is though. So we can do, we can try to do all sorts of things to raise your testosterone, but the number one thing that lowers testosterone is stress. Mm -hmm. Environmental toxins, uh, phthalates, plastics, cadmium, arsenic. Sure, all of those things and not getting the nutrients, which we'll talk about, vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, et cetera. But cortisol and these levels of cortisol, your cortisol levels for the day, if we add them all up, they should be between about a 10 and a 13. Yours is about an 18, 19. Oh, wow. And so you're, you're at least 50% higher than you I'm should. I'm an overachiever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. You're winning. But you're, mm -hmm. even though your body's holding up now, there is that sign that it's starting to become more catabolic. Okay. which means you're going to have more difficulty keeping muscle mass on, building muscle mass. You'll start to add potentially a little bit of body fat. You'll have more irritability, more brain fog, more you know lower mood, grogginess, um, those types of things. Right. 
Yeah. And so what we want to do is we're going to lower this through lifestyle, food, and nutritional supplementation. Okay. And then we're going to track your sleep overnight to make sure you're getting 1.5 hours of deep and two hours of REM. Okay. And that'll be a really great sign that your testosterone is going to rebound. Now, the nice thing is you don't have to run this whole lab again if you don't want. You can just run your testosterone DHEA number. Okay. And just with one tube of saliva in the morning. So okay. it's super simple. That's okay. awesome. To retest. Could there be any, any um, nutrient deficiencies that can cause SBHG to be too mu too high, like boron? I heard a boron deficiency can cause that. All, all of the ones that would raise testosterone naturally, uh, a deficiency would also, not all of them, Got but it. would also affect sex hormone binding globulin. Got yes. it. Got it. And so- Testosterone can basically convert over to DHT, and DHT actually has two pathways. Right. Um, it can convert over to estrogen, or it can convert over uh, to, what did I just say? Uh, you said DHT, and you said uh, estrogen, estrogen. or be bound up by sex hormone binding. Got hormone. it. Yep. Got it. So those are three ways. And we want it to pool as free testosterone, mm. that it can be used, or dihydrotestosterone, which can be used. Okay. So what stress-relieving techniques have you seen have the most success besides total lifestyle change? Because obviously sometimes you just got to change your lifestyle, yes. whatever. But have you seen uh, like great results from things like meditation, from you know, maybe uh, you know, not having electronics on two hours before bed. Like, what, where have you seen some of the best maybe success? The sauna, infrared sauna. Basically, all of those things. And this is so when I first was in my practice, I was saying, okay, binaural beats, those are phenomenal. Mm. Uh, meditation, fantastic. Qigong, Tai Chi, yoga, sauna, um, not necessarily cold plunge, which is more stimulating. Got it. Bre breath work. But then I say to the individual, uh, what are you actually willing to do? Because mm -hmm. that's the thing that matters. Right. Well, yeah. Doug's the bad. Yeah. He'll do. Yeah. He'll do it all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, so, he's a great client, and and, and th that actually is for some people too. So I say, okay, we don't want to do it all because then that's more stressful too. Got it. So what are the one or two things that you would actually enjoy doing? Because the goal here is to take Doug out of fight or flight, mm -hmm. and to put you more in what's called the rest and relax or parasympathetic nervous system. Mm -hmm. So what to you mm -hmm. would allow you to calm down the fastest? My goal is always to be able to help people catch themselves in fight or flight. So we use um, HRV testing or we do just biofeedback on the hour, oh. which just takes you back to your breath. Okay. So there's a lot of biofeedback based devices. Um, Hanu Health has one, um, Leaf has one, and or just a phone app that you would literally just entrain your breath work. Breath work is the number one way to get in the parasympathetic. Now I'm assuming, because he's he's high throughout the entire day, that if there was like an order of operation of what, which where would I attack first, I would think it would be before bed, like get Correct. that like mm -hmm. organized, okay. right? Absolutely. So put a routine yes. or start really trying to to get that fixed and then yeah. hopefully it'll- Something 100%. else you said that was, uh, I mean, I want to go back to because I think this is so important for people to hear is I said, you know, Doug's a great, you know, I, I used to train Doug way back in the day. He was one of my favorite clients because he would literally apply, you know, whatever I recommended. And you made a great point. You said, no, some people do everything and that that's just more stress. Mm -hmm. And that for Doug, that's perfect because I remember he did he did the one of those sleep rings that measures oh, your sleep. Yeah. Right. It made him sleep terrible because he was thinking about, about it yeah. constantly and trying to beat his score, so he had yes. to take it off. <laughs> so such and this isn't just for Doug. This is for anybody listening right now. Where sometimes doing everything mm -hmm. is more stressful than just doing one or two things, and you're actually going right. to give yourself worse. Well, worse I results. imagine the, the advice you give is very similar to what we give with strength training totally. exercises. You probably would say, listen, let's let's pick one of these, let's crush it, yeah. let's be consistent 100%. with it, and then we'll add on it, and then we'll add on it, and we'll do it that way, 100%. right? And yeah. I always go with the 80-20 rule. So the 80-20 rule, and again, I'm sure you've chatted about this, but it's 20% of your actions. So it's like the few things that you do that give you 80% of the results. Oh, yeah. So I could do a lot of things to get 100% of the results. I'd rather one or two things that give you 80% more likely to be consistent and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, consistent with what you believe you'll do. So I think meditation is great. However, when most people are done with meditation, it's done. And that's not beneficial. You need to be able to bring it with you throughout the day. So it's like, what can you do that keeps you at more of a sense of calm? And a lot of times in the beginning, it's just setting alarms every hour to just check back in, do a little by feedback, breathe, because you're you're trying to get your back body back and you're, it's really your nervous system to a, a more even resonance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Something I do, Dr. Cabral, and this was just worked really well for me. It was really hard for me to, to, to be present and have space to do so, especially if I have my phone near me. Our yes. business is media based and it's so easy for me to get on there. But when I go to the gym and I go in the sauna or steam room, I can't bring my phone mm -hmm. because it, it's too hot. So I've combined the two. So I'll go in the sauna and then I'll meditate or pray, which yes. is my form of meditation. So now I don't have my phone. I'm in the sauna and I'm already here. So now I can sit here and do this. And just a, a tip for people watching right now, if they find that it's really tough, sometimes putting yourself in a place where 
that hiking for some people works real great yeah, too because me because they're hiking and they're getting no reception anyway. Yeah. So it's like cool. I'm already off my I'm off my phone now as well. That's 100 percent agree. I call it three anchors. So I have three anchors throughout my day because I'm much more prone to overproducing now that my body's healthier. So in the morning, I have basically a half hour to an hour before my family's up. That's my time. It's not looking at my phone, not doing work. Nobody's up yet. I don't need to be texting or emailing, whatever it is. So that's my time to just kind of ease into the day, enjoy the day, do something inspirational, uh, meaning like listen to something inspirational, read something inspirational. Um, And then after lunch, not only is it healthy for my body, but I go for a walk. Mm. I have my phone, but I'm not looking at it because I put on binaural beats. And then that mid-afternoon before I get home, I like to just um, do a workout. That's my time. It's like afternoon. And then like, okay, the stress is eased away. And then try to pick one more before bed. These things are short. Like you don't have to do, do a lot of these things. Maybe it's a sauna. Maybe it's a relaxing shower. Do something to just calm things down. Okay, excellent. Mm-hmm. All right, so that so any more on his saliva or do we move on to the blood now? Move on to the blood. Yep. Okay. So um, the good thing is that, uh, well, we'll do one at a time. When we're looking at your free T4, you want it between a two- and a three. Okay. Um, So you want that between a one and a two, and you're a 1.5. So that's excellent. For your free T3, that was T4. So basically it goes from uh, TSH to T4 to T3. Okay. And then if your T3 doesn't look good, it's because it can be actually converted over to something called reverse T3. And the same reasons for sex hormone binding globulin being high, reverse T3 would be high. Got it. Now, uh, Doug, though, yours looks good. And most, I'll tell you this, women are much more prone to thyroid-based issues than men. Any it's reason, double the amount. Any reason why? Because I knew that fact, but I don't know why. Does it have to do with their hormone profile or? My hypothesis is the same reason as to why they're not able to do as long of a fast. So their body under stress begins to lower metabolism. Like So this, the uh, scientific part is there. Childbearing. That's right. So their metabolism drops way faster than men. And they do terrible on extended skipping of breakfast typically for a long period of time. I'm not saying every woman in the world, but if you put a woman's uh, endocrine system under greater stress, her TSH will go up showing lower thyroid, her cortisol levels, especially before bed will go up, her estrogen levels will remain normal, her progesterone levels will just drop mm. and it causes estrogen dominance and cause infertility. It's one of the number one things we see in our practice. Men, not to the same degree. I had a female client that was uh, fasting till three o'clock every day, loved it at first. Then she started, her hair started falling out. Mm. She started getting all these symptoms of of stress. So it's exactly what you're saying. And that's right. They feel, everyone feels better in the beginning because one, 30% of the energy you typically use per day is going towards food. So if you're not putting any food in your stomach, okay, well, we got a little bit more energy yeah. back. And then also a lot of people have gut-based issues. So when they put food in their stomach, well, there's a slow peristaltic movement. Food sits there for longer. It begins to ferment. That causes bloating and gas. Nobody feels good from that. So, you know, there's different reasons for that. But in the beginning, people can feel better. And then, yes, you start to get depleted and more catabolic. Interesting. Men just takes much longer. Okay. Very interesting. Uh, so overall thyroid, uh, your free T3 was a, between a three and a four is a 3.1. That looks good. Your TSH levels, thyroid stimulating hormone should be between a 0.5 and a two for optimal. Yours is a 0.9. So it's excellent. Your TPO antibodies, um, should be below a 50. Yours are a eight and they look great. So no issues there. Your insulin in the morning should be between a two and a six. Yours is totally normal. Hemoglobin A1C should be below a 5.7. Yours is a 4.9. Perfect. Your vitamin D though, is low at a 38. So conventional medicine will tell you that the normal range is between 30 and 100. It's an insane range, which is why, again, people do not have the proper immune system that they should have. And the optimal range is between 50 and 70. Okay. Not above, because that's pushing your immune system too much, and maybe even a little bit of what's called hypercalcemia. Mm-hmm. So it's pulling more calcium into your arteries, which we don't not want. Good. Um, and yours is a 38. So it's not going to take a lot more, but if you're not using any vitamin D right mm-hmm. now, are you using a vitamin? I am, which is, again, interesting because I did the blood test back in July, yes. and it came as a 66.6, and then prior to that in February, it was 65.3. So I, I find it interesting that I'm so low on this. Are you using the same exact dosage of uh, vitamin yeah, D? Yeah, about 5,000 I use a day. Yep. And it's not, so it's how many months removed? Two months removed, maybe month and a half removed from when you're doing it, where you're getting less sun towards the end of August? Uh, or towards yeah, the, the mid end of August. Probably, I had more. We were in uh, Mexico in yep. end of June, so so that and that's the way to again. This is all to bio individuality. So my goal for you is like when you're in Mexico or you're getting a lot of sun, you don't need to supplement vitamin D. Mm-hmm. But when you're not, 
and, and someone like you, where you have a pretty good base, you may only need 2,000 IUs a day. Yeah. Like you don't need 4,000 IUs, which a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. but I supplement so, with vitamin D um, in the winter months much more than I do in the summer. Summer yeah. months, it's sometimes or not at all. Winter months, I, I bump it. But so this, yeah. so this highlights that it's important or that it could be very important to test yourself uh, maybe two or three times a year. That's right. Okay. For, especially for vitamin D. Got it. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And that can be a single vial as well. Okay. Uh, actually, that's a blood spot. Sorry. Okay. Vitamin D is always tested with blood. Okay. As a, as a sample there. Interesting. So um, overall, uh, your results, when we're looking at these, we want to lower the conversion to estrogen. Mm -hmm. So typically we always recommend, well, one is we're going to recommend reducing stress. That's first and foremost, because then that will help with testosterone not converting to more estrogen. The second is increasing uh, cruciferous vegetable intake, okay. which will then help process the estrogen and remove it from the body faster. So that, that's a big thing. Is that from DIM that's in? That's uh, right. Okay. So then you can take a supplement, which is DIN, mm -hmm. um, as well as I3C. Got it. We call that estrogen balance. It combines both of those together. Mm -hmm. So and these don't have to be long-term. So once we get the stress levels, namely cortisol lower, testosterone will begin to rebound. Estrogen will begin to naturally lower. Your thyroid's already good. We're going to add a little bit more vitamin D if you're not maintaining a 10. And that's going to help with the um, testosterone. And then um, three of the things that I just want to say are great for testosterone, um, which I think I already put in here, are vitamin C, okay. zinc, mm -hmm. vitamin D, which we just chatted about. And then if you're not using any magnesium, Mm -hmm. A little bit of magnesium and ashwagandha. We use a product called, um, uh, well, you can use two. One's called Adrenal Soothe. The other's called Daily Testosterone Support, which would have vitamin C, zinc, et cetera, in it. But again, I don't want people to supplement their way out of high levels of cortisol, right? Mm -hmm. Your goal is to lower yeah. the cortisol, use Adrenal Soothe in the beginning, which is ashwagandha, L-theanine, phospholocerine, you know, so people can get these anywhere to be able to lower those levels and then reset the diurnal rhythm. So diurnal rhythm means... Up during the day from about, let's say, 7 in the morning to 7 at night, then turn it off from 7 at night to 7 in the morning the okay. be as best you can. A question for you, because yes. last time we did the hair test, and my magnesium was high when mm -hmm. I did that. Yes. Um, but when I got the vitamin stack from you, you included magnesium. I was curious why that was uh, included. Yeah, so if I'm remembering correctly, on your minerals and metals test, you had a 4 high which was all of your electrolytes were elevated, calcium, magnesium, sodium, and potassium. Okay. Now, the interesting thing is these are two completely different labs. They don't share data at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You had a four high on that lab showing high levels of stress. Your all four of your cortisol were elevated today as well. The same, two different labs saying the same exact thing. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the way that we calm fight or flight is with, we don't supplement potassium, uh, but we can supplement magnesium. Okay. Especially the latter half of the day. Excellent. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Any other All questions? Right. Yeah. No, no I, I think that's took, it. took a while with me. Yeah. Uh, I'm a, a, <laughs> and so that's a work. This one. <laughs> <laughs> well, that explains the overall test too. So the first one, you kind of always get the most, yeah. and then we'll be able to you kind of know all the the different parameters. All right. So um, for Justin's, uh, same thing. Estrogen should be below 1.2, 0.5 to 1.2. Uh, yours was a 1.9. Hmm. So again, a little bit stronger conversion of. Uh, testosterone to estrogen. We'll get to that in a moment. Okay. Um, progesterone was really great at a 24. Testosterone, um, so typical uh, testosterone for your age range would be 90 to about 120. Now, that does not mean, so the, the range actually for healthy goes up to 148. Let's call it 150. Okay. You can be at the top end of that range. So there's nothing wrong with that at any age. Like you can be 60 years old and be 140, 150. Okay. No, nothing wrong with that all. And you can do it. Um, it took me a long time. I used to have low testosterone, high level of estrogen as well as a teenager. Like it was awful. Um, and then again, get body healthy. My uh, testosterone a on average is the high 130s or low 140s. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and that's just using all natural based uh, solutions. But mainly it's from calming that sympathetic nervous system at night and sleep. Like okay. that's, that's one of the biggest things. So Justin, your testosterone was a 163. So it was a little high, high out of range. Huh. Now, you're using some testosterone replacement uh, therapy mm -hmm. uh, or treatment, TRT. So why I bring this up is if you're going to use TRT, you want to use it exactly like Justin's using it. It's the perfect amount of TRT for your body. Mm -hmm. It's just at the high end of normal which means that it's not going to have any of the potential ramifications that can happen with using too much testosterone. Hmm. So back in the day when, let's say even 10 years ago, 
when doctors were using TRT, and actually a lot of doctors are, are still doing this, unfortunately, they are not retesting free testosterone and they're just doing it and just giving anything based on symptoms. Yeah. And the problem is that not today, not tomorrow, not even next year, in your later 50s and early 60s, you can end up with um, heart disease or heart attack. You can end up with higher blood pressure. Uh, you can end up with enlarged prostate. You can end up with low sperm count. You can end up with higher levels of estrogen and um, potentially sleep apnea as well. Mm. And so it's important just to be cognizant of that because TRT is just very, very common now. And so you just want to make sure that you're using the appropriate dosage in order to get you to optimal levels. So you said it's converting now, though, on the higher end of estrogen? That's correct. Okay. So, so then you just need something to block so that estrogen. Address that. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So my goal, and it's not too high, so it can go up to a 2.2, but for me, I'm always about optimal. Like, what's optimal? Well, right. optimal is 1.2 or less. So first, I'm using a product called Estrogen Balance, which contains DIM and I3C. I'm also going to make sure liver function is good. And I'm going to get those cruciferous vegetables in your diet every day, at least two cups to three cups. Now, can, mm -hmm. can you do that in conjunction with running TRT? Yes, absolutely. Oh, okay, yeah, cool. yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. oh so yeah. question I have um, around that. So with, with testosterone replacement therapy, typically, usually it's done through, well, it can be done through injection. And they do what they yeah. use what's called a long la, long acting ester, mm -hmm. meaning you inject testosterone, and the highest peak is the day after, two days after, and then it slowly declines to your next dose. Yes, could the timing of this test be affected by the timing of your testosterone injection? One hundred percent. Okay. Yep. Hmm. So if you did it the day before, you may see a much higher range Elevated, versus if you do it the yeah, day no. before, you're supposed to do your next next injection. And and if you're going to do it, I just say always do it right. So the easiest way to do it is. You'll just get, uh, like, how often would you do it? Uh, once for, a week. Once. Usually once a week. Okay. Yeah. So there are some people who are doing tiny amounts daily. They're doing the same for growth hormone. And, yeah. and there are some people that are doing two to three times a week. And there's some people who are doing weekly. Yeah. So it really depends. Now, what I would say is, okay, get three tubes that you're going to do the day after, yeah. two days later, mm. and two days after that. Because what that if you're, you like, really low six, yeah. six days later? Okay, yeah. well, like, let's do a little less, but let's do it twice. Yeah. You know, so again, you'd have to use a different type because there's a long lasting. And so it wouldn't it. work. You wouldn't want to, but you would know when you drop and it helps your doctor out because your doctor is not going to be running these labs. Most likely some will. Um, and for you to run uh, a venous blood draw mm -hmm. is not only a pain uh, and it's painful, but you're spending a lot out of pocket. Yeah, and it's, it's just thing. inconvenient. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I actually divide yeah. mine into two doses. So instead of taking one dose once a week, I do Are you two, still doing that? And I feel better. Oh, I know you experiment with that. I didn't know if you I feel better. But I mean, they say, you know, they'll say it doesn't make a difference. I, it does for me. I feel better. I don't get the highest peak, but I also don't feel like I go down as yeah, low. So. I, if people are going to do it, the smaller, more often dosage is going to be mimicking more naturally what the body would naturally do anyway. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some people now do sub-Q with the oil. They actually do these tiny little doses throughout the week, uh, sub-Q, mm. which is really weird, but that's a new thing. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah, I don't know as much about that. Um, going on to, so basically what I'm saying is the amount that you're using, at least uh, yours was the day before, uh, is the is the proper amount. Okay, no, cool. no doubt about it. Now, does it drop too low six days later or five days later? Or four, maybe. Because mm. remember, yeah. um, it's impossible to say, does it last a week? Right. It depends on liver clearance. Like that's how right. quickly that's are you right. going to bind up and clear this testosterone from your body? That's yeah. different for every individual. Yeah. That, that's a genetic thing. We had to manipulate that. So the doctors and I had to go back and forth a couple of times where I started at every seven days, then six days, and then five days because of that. It was mm. it was drop. I would get I would look great the day or two after, yes. and then I would actually drop uh, even lower than what I did coming into the, my testosterone that's test. That's right. Yeah. And that's, that's the worst part because your highs feel amazing, but your lows yeah. are depressive. They're awful. Right, so right. yes, you have to, well, it can be not just de depression, but it can be irritability, mood swings. You have like all the symptoms yeah. of like low blood sugar, but you're not low blood sugar. <laughs> right. There it is, Adam. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll get to Adam's. So your, um, your DHEA though, Justin's perfect. It's 12.4. So super strong a DHEA. Your cortisol in the morning should be between a six and a nine. Yours is 7.6. So excellent. Your cortisol at lunch is elevated, so it's a 3.8. Okay. Cortisol is not massively elevated, but it's certainly elevated. Cortisol in the evening is almost double, so it is high around dinner time. Interesting. Yeah, I, I, I figured my uh, in the morning was going to be the lowest, which you want that to be the highest, you right? Do. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yours is normal in the morning, but the problem is it's going to feel low to you. Yeah. So this is the beginning of more of a 
It's not getting burnt out, but it's moving to suboptimal. And the reason is that your evening is also high normal. So everything in your day is high, high, high normal, and then morning's going to feel like low. Because mm-hmm. if it's oh, not high normal as I well, see. for you, it's going to feel like a low. And so you're going to feel like maybe a brain fog in the morning, uh, tough to get going, a little okay. slower, those types of things. It's always been that way. <laughs> yeah. I just say, that explains a lot, <laughs> right? what, what Probably effect, way worse, even. It's getting a lot better. What, if, what effects do, does caffeine have on the stress hormones? Because I know caffeine is a stimulant. Yes. It's energized. Um, does it, it, let's say your cortisol is a little out of whack. Is that one of the first things you want to try to lower or remove? So caffeine for someone with lower cortisol and lower dopamine, and because there are people more of an endomorphic body type, mm. they don't produce as much cortisol, they don't produce as much norepinephrine. They're slower to get going. For them, a cup of coffee in the morning could be fantastic. Okay, like it's not, and you can actually measure these results. Um, I would have no problem. Uh, I always, again, I like to use. Uh, so up first and foremost, I don't have any issues with coffee at all. If someone has high cortisol in the morning, like I wouldn't recommend coffee for a dog. Caffeinated coffee, you could do a Swiss water process decaf organic. Like that's totally fine. You get all the antioxidants from it. Coffee's super high in antioxidants. Basically what I do, I avoid caffeine for the most part. Excellent. And we're going to use a product for you that has, again, ashwagandha, L-theanine, some phospholocerin to get these levels down while you're getting the lifestyle things to stick. Because lifestyle takes six, 12 weeks to really like get it to stick. Mm -hmm. The supplements can help right away. Right. Yeah. Okay. And the meditation, the breath work. Um, So what we're going to do for you is lower the second half of the day cortisol okay. and then give you a little boost in the morning. Now, a boost in the morning would be something like um, rhodiola, licorice root, all of those things herbal-wise. Or you can do a cup of coffee. Like, it's not that you can't. I just don't want that to extend through the day and I don't know how that would look. So if you, do you use coffee in the morning? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, yes. all right. Then forget yeah, it. Then we already see that. She does coffee so, IVs throughout the day. <laughs> they, they make fun of me how yeah, frequent it is. So. Yeah. so for you then, if you're saying it's coffee throughout the day, I would do coffee before noon because yeah. your your caffeine has a half-life of at least six hours. Okay. And so if you're having another one at, you know, two, three in the afternoon. I feel that too, by the way. If I go past 12, it's, yeah. It, absolutely. It goes too far into my sleep. Yeah, I know it's a huge difference on that yeah. too. So we'll, we'll certainly want to work on that. We'll keep that. You can do decaf to help wean yourself off. Um, and then that would work as well. Yeah. Um, so your overall thyroid levels, again, your your thyroid, should, T4 should be a one and a two. Between a one and a two, you're a 1.2. It's great. Your T3 should be between a three and a four. You're a 3.8. Your TSH should be a 0.5 to a two. You're a 1.5. So even though it seems like it's climbing, no, no problem at all. Again, this is also a snapshot in time. Right. So anytime you do blood work, it's a snapshot in time. And that's kind of what I was saying to you, Doug, as well. It's like um, when you test blood work, that's what it was that day. Now, vitamin D should be pretty steady if you're getting same levels of vitamin D. And it's also a fat-soluble vitamin. Um, but hormones could change from day to day. Like mm-hmm. that, that's important to look at that. So it should always be done on a normal day. And then, and it's usually within your range as well. Your TPO antibodies are below a 50. They're a 22. So that's great. Your insulin in the morning is a 7.7, which is certainly showing a little bit more of what's called a stressor in the morning. Sometimes it's called the cortisol awakening response. Um, sometimes it's dipping into low blood sugar, or sometimes it's just the, the mind's racing right when we get up. There's some mm. type of stressor there. Okay. And um, your hemoglobin A1C is great at a 5.0, should be below a 5.7. And your vitamin D is a 31. So you're within the conventional medicine normal range, but again, I would like to, to bump you up. Yeah, and that's probably just recently gone up because I've been getting a lot more sun uh, being out at practice and whatnot. Like yes. before that, I was feeling the effects of low vitamin D for sure. And I think it's really important that most people, and again, this is my opinion, but it's also backed up by tens of thousands of labs we run. Most people do well with a lower dose, like 2000 I use as an adult daily. Mm-hmm. And the reason is, is that vitamin D affects almost everything in the body. Like Mm. every hormone, all of your metabolism, your skin turnover, your immune system. So I would rather err on the side of use 2,000 IUs a day unless you're literally going to the beach that day or getting a lot of sun. Because if you think about it, I mean, well, actually you go into practice, you might be wearing shorts and a t-shirt. So it's almost full body exposure. But a lot of people like, oh, well, I'm outside for like 20 minutes a day. Yeah, but like their entire body's covered. Like my body's covered. So I can't really get vitamin D exposure Mm -hmm. just on my face. It's not gonna be enough. Don't some scientists call, consider vitamin D uh, almost like a hormone? Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And because it affects the hormone pathways in the body. So thyroid and testosterone. Now your testosterone is good, but we want to look at that. Yeah, well, I barely ever supplement with vitamin D. So that would be something I would like to see the effects, you know, yes. if I start doing that. And and then, you, so you always want to take vitamin D with something like a daily activated multi, or we use the daily nutritional support. And the reason is 
vitamin D needs all the cofactors. So a lot of people take vitamin D and their levels are still low. Mm. You need K2, you need magnesium, you need calcium. You need these things that help shuttle it into the cells. Got it. Okay. All right. So um, overall, it was good. And um, again, what I'm saying too is uh, monitor your testosterone replacement therapy. Just always make sure that it's the level it should be. Now, the thing is, once you dial all of this in, let's say you you reduce your stress levels, um, it may actually boost your testosterone, it will boost your testosterone potentially naturally. Mm -hmm. So you might even need a little bit less of a dose, mm -hmm. but you only know that until you start testing uh, and you okay. can really optimize your health that way. Very cool. All right, Adam is up. Oh boy. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> and the <laughs> big it. winner today. Little, little, little audio. <laughs> <laughs> go easy on me, Doc. Bets. Go easy on me. There weren't any bets here. Everybody, yeah. everybody got real quiet once the labs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you know, freaking <laughs> Sal got disqualified. It's lame. Yeah. Uh, it would be, it would be good, but yeah. it's okay. Uh, um, part bad. two. So I don't um, bleed easily. Estrogen uh, again should be that uh, 0.5 to 2.2, but ideally below at 1.2. Yours was the lowest at 1.4. Yeah. So it's, it's close, and I know you're doing things. Yeah. To actually, I would have guessed that for sure, and I wish I would have thought to remember to bring this to today's uh, interview because. When I took the test, I did write it down in my bathroom, and I don't remember what it was because I, I wanted to know when I got my labs that I could tell you, oh, that this is four days after my shot or five yes. days after, oh, so we I could see. actually be a little. But I, so I have that. So for the audience, I'll go back and look. But I and I think uh, I I it was towards the end. I think it was like on day. I want to say like five. So right before I was supposed to take another shot. So I, as an aromatase inhibitor or for just TRT? testosterone, you mean just testosterone? Well, both okay. actually, because the way it goes, it goes, uh, I take my shot. Then the next day I take one milligram of arimidex and then, uh, then 48 hours later I take another, or for, and then the next day I go arimidex and then I'm off until I take my next shot again. Okay. That's kind of the order. Okay. And we've had to tweak that a lot because my estrogen levels have been up and down and up yeah. and down. So that's been one of the most challenging things for us to balance. Okay. And so, your progesterone was was a higher at a fifty five that men typically are. I'm going to explain that in just a moment. Okay. Um, but when was your last injection of the TRT? Well, as in before, right. before the lab test. That's what I have written down. I don't know. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's so I think it was. I think I have it written down at home. I'll double because it says one day on this lab. Oh, did I write it? Yes. Oh, okay. Then that's what it okay. is. Okay. okay I knew I wrote it down. I Got didn't know it. if I wrote it down on the. Okay, great. So the lab actually asks you what pharmaceuticals you're taking. And what natural therapy? Oh, you're good. Taking. So I did so write it down. I know. Okay, good. And I that did. helps me read the lab too, because sometimes there I'm like, why is this? I'll have women come in that are not going. To, like you're all seeing good. Whoever the doctor is is good. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They're very good. Mm -hmm. There are people that call themselves functional medicine doctor and prescribe these hormones, and the levels are awful. Like they're ridiculously high, off the chart wow. for women as well. Like well, that, this was chart. my experience. I had I went through a different clinic before, and they just mm. were they were terrible. They, People are they have to be specifically trained in this. Yeah, and I knew they not, weren't as no, I, I'd ask. I know I'm not very knowledgeable, and I'd ask questions, and that I knew more of the answer yeah. than they. And I'm like, this is this can't be good. Yeah. That's that's always a dead yeah. giveaway. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So looking at your testosterone, though, again, um, normal range, uh, 44 to 148, but really, we're, we want you around 100. Okay, so okay. for your age range, you're at a 223. Okay. Now the upper limit we would say is 150. Okay. Now if you're using TRT, you can of course be a little bit higher. What I would say is this is a higher level than I would like to see. Okay. Now, that there's two things we have to think about. You're almost a one um, right one after day the out. yeah right. Just so now, what does it look like six days out, seven days out? It does it drop then to that low level still or not? Yeah, this it actually might be really dosage. drops. That was part of why we actually increased the dose mm -hmm. was because I I did had a, a um I forgot how he described it, but a you know faster you know rise and drop. You metabolize it very quickly. Yeah. So let's say you're use let's say though that once you're on it that this is this is the plan for most people. You're right. not typically coming right, off. right. Okay, so let's say you're using this, you're living to 100 years old. Let's say you're using this for the next 60 years. Got it. It's worth experimenting right now and, and this will only get better and better. Is it better for you to use a shorter acting every other day? I'm going every to day? now. I mean after hearing, you know, I didn't know Sal actually went through and st stuck with it, but I have an experiment with that okay. where or I actually smaller break doses, yeah, smaller dose. Or you yeah. might keep like, you more level. Yeah, no, you I could I, also I, do a propione, but then you'd have to inject every day or, you know, so it's kind of a pain in the butt or I think just simply breaking it up in two will make yeah. a big difference. Yeah. Yeah, and talk with your um functional medicine doctor about that, yeah. you know, whether whether they want to look at that, but and here's why I wanted to share a little bit more. So it's not just affecting your testosterone um, that day. So it's it's a little on the higher side that I would like to see, meaning like, because I want you to find something that you can then just do forever. Right. And it works with your body and everybody's right. body's a little bit different. But your DHEA, it should be between, 
ideally a six and an 18. Yours is a, almost a 40. Oh, to 39. Wow. So, but you might say like, well, why is that? Well, it's the same reason progesterone is a 55. So if you look at the hormonal pathway, again, it goes cholesterol, pregnenolone, and then it goes DHEA, testosterone, estrogen. But then on the other pathway, it goes progesterone, cortisol. You have so much hormone in your body that it's totally satisfying testosterone, yeah. but then it's raising progesterone and it's raising DHEA. And if you see in your lab now, it's raising cortisol as well. Your AM cortisol should be between a uh, six and a nine. You're a 17.4. Wow. So high levels of cortisol. Okay. You're a three at noon. So you're just out of range. Um, you are 3.3 in the evening. So you're almost double the range. And at night, you are a 0.8. We want you at a 0.4 or less. So you have, when you look at like the bucket of hormone, your bucket's overflowing. You have so much hormone in your body yeah. that it has to go somewhere. So he's hormonal. He's <laughs> hormonal. There's a lot. It's a lot of hormone in this body. So when we're looking to optimize, we're saying like, yeah, what are you may feel well, okay, but it's too much. Question. Okay. Got a question for you yeah. because um, he was because we're we are also and same for same for me. Like my wife, we're gonna have a baby in the next couple months. Okay, mm -hmm. so. Along with my testosterone replacement therapy, I was also put on HCG yes. to boost, to maintain sperm production. That's right. HCG uh, mimics luteinizing hormone, which drives the production of all these other hormones. Taking testosterone, that can't get converted back to DHEA, right? But the HCG could boost the DHEA. And I know you're using HCG as well. I am. Could yeah. the HCG be more res what's responsible for the elevated of the uh, elevation of the other hormones? Potentially. Okay. But if we look at it, once testosterone needs are satisfied and your body, so your body's essentially shifting it to say, how many total places can this hormone shift to? It can shift to aldosterone, which we haven't talked today, which could cause high blood pressure. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Water retention and all that stuff, right? That's, and that goes with estrogen right. and aldosterone. That's okay, correct. Yeah. So what we want to just say, are there any symptoms? So symptoms, again, I didn't, I don't have your questionnaire or anything, but um, you can start to feel like you're burning out because like it, everything is just being pushed to the max. Hard to turn your mind off more aggressive, more anger, more competitive, more irritable, uh, forgetful or trouble focusing, trouble sleeping. And then for men, when they start to have more estrogen and higher levels of cortisol, they can start to put on belly fat, uh, fat underneath the armpits, like right around the pecs muscles. And that's kind of like a, a giveaway that uh, there's too much of a high stress based process going mm -hmm. on in the body. Okay. So we're, so right away, I already know I'll probably, cause here's a challenge. Cause again, this is taken a day after, and this is some of the stuff that Dr. Ran and I have talked about it, and why I had moved up the dose. And we were pushing these things was because it, by come day five and six, I really go the opposite direction. Yes. And so, you know, he, they started me off at a lower dose and, and it wasn't, a, it was, I would, and I would probably would have tested much better after the day or two days, you know, mm -hmm. afterwards to this test. But then if you got me four days later, I was really low. So I definitely think splitting it would be something that will help. What are some other natural things that I can do to improve this? That's, that's actually what I was going to recommend because um, there's only so much that you can do in terms of a pharmacological intervention, yeah. but you would feel better towards even the end of this if we reduce some of the higher cortisol stress-based production. Mm. And so then you wouldn't be zapping your testosterone naturally as much, okay. like lowering it. Th this would hold and you're, well, again, at some point, your own natural testosterone is going to start to shut down if it's at a higher level. Yeah. Um, so we just want to be cognizant of that. So then you'll you'll be dependent on that, which again is okay. Um, but we just don't want to believe then we can kickstart our own until you were lower dosage or off of it, yeah. right? But the cortisol will absolutely make you feel better about that. Less estrogen conversion will make you feel much better. Uh, your DHEA is already fantastic, which will help you feel well. But then- and I don't know that I'd necessarily recommend the daily testosterone support for you. I don't think it would have the same effect. However, I would recommend something like the Adrenal Soothe, a magnesium, which I believe you're already taking right yeah. now, optimizing your vitamin D. So not to cut to the chase, but your vitamin D was a 26. Okay. So we want to optimize your vitamin C, vitamin D as well. Yeah. And all of these things in conjunction with working with your doctor to find the right dosage or timing for you is what's going to find this sweet spot that you always feel level because you actually just want to feel level. You don't want to feel like go, 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 you know, can't turn it off or then you're burning up. Yeah. Got well, it. complete transparency for the audience. And I just, I just want to admit this. So, you know, too, 
Um, after we saw you last time, I was really good uh, and consistent for about a month or a month and a half of taking the supplements. When it ran out, now I ha I have I've missed my adrenal soothe. Mm -hmm. um, I've definitely had some days I've missed my my vitamin D. So I've been inconsistent with the the supplementation that you had already put me on before. So you know, just another reminder for me to get back to being consistent with those things for sure. In addition to maybe splitting the dose up and I might, cause I actually feel really good right now. Yeah, I do feel really good. I do feel my sleep is not the best right now. I think, uh, I'm, I'm a heavier than I, I normally am. I've woke myself up a few times. Katrina has mentioned that she's heard me snoring, which is yeah. not normal for me. Um, and so I do, I think that can be improved. Um, and so ho hopefully leaning out in the next month or so will Im improve that splitting my dose up and then making sure I'm taking, which you had already prescribed me. I mean, that you've already told me the adrenal soothe was on my list. And so mm -hmm. was the vitamins, vitamin D anything yeah, else. Um, we want to make sure that you're whatever you're doing. Cause it sounds like there's a little extra inflammation as well that we're, so we, we've talked about your autoimmune. Yep. Uh, based issues in the past. So if again, if we're going back to the beginning of our conversation and we're looking at stress, cortisol, and we're looking at gut, we just want to make sure your gut functions good. And yeah. I don't know if we've ever run a gut uh, lab. We haven't, but that's that. the next thing I want to do with you. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to look at that and we want to do a true holistic picture. So we can fix stress, but if there's gut issues, okay, it's going to be causing more inflammation, yeah. more likely for sleep apnea, more likely. So your testosterone replacement therapy will work better if everything else in your body is working better. Of and you'll be, be less reliant on it for how you feel highs and lows. Got it. Yeah. And it will work even better. Yeah. Okay. 100%. Excellent. So thyroid for you, uh, again, uh, free T4 should be between a one and a two. You're a 1.7. It's excellent. Your free T3 should be between a three and a four. And you are a 2.8. So you might say, oh, that's a little bit low. We'll, we'll get to that in just one second. Your TSH should be between a 0.5 and a two. You're a 1.3. And your TPO antibodies are super low. They're a six. So then you go to your free T3 and you're like, oh, that seems a little bit low. Um, you should not make a big deal out of one specific number if your TSH is still below a two. And the reason is, is that there isn't necessarily a need or a call, most likely in your body, for more thyroid. Because if there was, thyroid stimulating hormone would typically be higher to call for it. So if TSH was like a 2.8 um, and your free T4 was a, or your free T3, which it is 2.8, I'd say, okay, we're not getting enough of that thyroid made. First reason, higher levels of stress. Higher levels, if, again, I hate to say it, but women's hormones have a much more difficult time staying balanced than men. This scenario, um, again, we 70% of our practice is typically women, 30% men. You'll see these thyroid numbers all uh, like literally so dysfunctional because of high levels of cortisol. So sure. yours is strong. They look good. I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily do anything there. Your insulin in the morning is a little high. It's a 7.8 should be between two and six. Uh, again, that can be higher levels of cortisol. It's called the cortisol awakening response. Yeah. It's highest uh, upon waking mm. when cortisol spikes. Remember it's a glucocorticoid. It can actually be increasing your own glucose levels without you even eating anything. And all this could be caused by what I was saying about having bad sleep and maybe even snoring. 100%. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, sleep apnea is a, a tough one or just, you know, wakes throughout yeah. the night. Um, your hemoglobin A1C is great, though. It's below four. And uh, your vitamin D, we want to optimize. It's a 26. Yeah. So even if you were to get sun over the next two, three weeks, I would still supplement vitamin D to get it right back up. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Excellent. So who got the most green? <laughs> okay, so it, it wasn't Adam. Like I killed yeah, so, we knew it was to be there. <laughs> let's see here. Uh, oh, I didn't even hand out your labs to you. Uh, it was Justin. Yeah, wow. the big winner. Gold star. Here you go, Justin. So healthy. Yeah. He's the most nourished. Oh, so healthy. <laughs> yep, so healthy. <laughs> so optimized. Uh, but yeah. the nice thing is, as I said before, so uh, Adam, for you, what I would do is get your lifestyle, tier T, your supplements where you want them to be, yep. then retest this again. Yeah, yeah. And that would be great. I think yeah. this really highlights the importance of looking at the big picture, right? I mean, you, mm -hmm. for example, you said, look, if, you're, if, you're, if your T3 is a little low, we also have to see that your TSH is high to say, right. okay, this is an issue. Otherwise, whatever your, your, you know, your T3 number is, so long as it's not super low. That's right. It's it's what your body needs and your body's util, utilizing it well. So it does highlight, and that's just one example, but it highlights that one test, one thing, one metric, I mean, doesn't really tell you the whole story, unless it's in a danger level, mm -hmm. doesn't tell you much. You got to look at the whole picture and that's a lot of what you guys do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And even if it is in the danger level, 
well, what are the underlying root causes rather right. than prescribing something in order to fix that, like a pharmaceutical drug or whatever it mm -hmm. might be. So I, I think that this is this is accessible. The thing I'm trying to share with people is I I learned about this because I was sick many years ago, two years without a diagnosis, going to the best specialist around yeah. Boston. So just to, for people that know that, hey, I don't know if you're going to do this or not, but you can run this with an integrative health practitioner, uh, with a naturopathic doctor, with our team, and you can get your results whenever you want them. You can do it right at home, yeah. which is great. This is about as individualized uh, of an approach as I can imagine. Because you're doing, I, I, when we do the run, when you're looking at the gamut of tests, there's hair, blood, saliva, and then gut testing. Did I hit them all? Yeah. So we look at um, just say here for what's being excreted in the heavy metals, the so minerals and metals. The gut testing can be done in three ways blood spot for your food sensitivities urine to look at candida overgrowth as well as vitamin markers, permeability. And then you can look at stool for parasites and bacterial overgrowth mm. as well as H. pylori. So I want, are we all going to, I think we should all do that one too. We well, as well do the whole game. Yeah, I'd like to look at the overgrowth one for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I want to that do that because I feel like we'll one? have the complete picture after that, right? Absolutely. Because I mean, I mean, I wouldn't even think to ask you that. Like uh, all the things that were kind of off on me, uh, what if I had something like SIBO? Could that be dramatically affecting a lot of those things too? Well, it could be in, uh, absolutely affecting your inflammation to a great degree, right? which would potentially affect something like lowering testosterone, lowering these things. But that's why I think it's so important too, that to me, I have no problem with people using TRT, but don't use it to mask other symptoms that of might course, be going on. Right. Cause you're going to feel great. Of course. Like, it's difficult not to feel great when you're boosting those testosterone levels. Yeah, what the so, audi what the audience knows that maybe you don't because I don't think I've communicated this. It was almost two years that I went trying to do this all 100 percent natural. So mm -hmm. I I was constantly now I didn't have access. I didn't have you. I didn't go through you. Uh, I wish I would have done that early on to see it really dial try to dial some things and I try to do it with my my level of education on it with every natural way possible. Um, and I saw some improvements, but I didn't get it into like the optimal range. That's my highest recommendation. So again, I have, again, no issues with uh, testosterone replacement therapy. What I want people to do is optimize all of the numbers. I want them to be able to get the nutrients their body needs in order to produce the levels of testosterone they need to produce. And if it's still not working after, let's say, a four to six month period of time, okay. Well, yes. This, is, this was a lot of our motivation for this partnership was uh, we knew that we would be working too with a TRT clinic. We also were concerned about our – we did not want – our community think like we want to push people into just taking testosterone because all of us on the podcast have always yeah. said that we always recommend going the holistic way first and doing everything you can in your it, possible naturally yes. before you go that Look, route. It doesn't so, make yeah. any sense if, if you're tired all the time because you're not sleeping. And so you're just going to take more stimulants, right? right? Or your head hurts because you're banging against the wall. So let me just take some painkillers. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. So it's, it's, it's most important that you look at all of your lifestyle factors and then if that doesn't work, Western medicine does a great job when it comes to, you know, certain hormone deficiencies or whatever. Um, but uh, up until that point, is it your lifestyle? Is it something you're That's missing? Right. Look at those things. Because otherwise what will happen is if you feel bad because your testosterone is low because of something in your lifestyle, then you raise your testosterone. You may feel better, but whatever was causing that to be low in the first place is still there, causing other problems in your body. So it's, it's very important. Exactly right. And that's the thing. So focus on your nutrition, focus on your supplements, focus on your weight training, two, three times a week minimum. Uh, not overdoing that if you're someone that's more of a hard gainer or high mm -hmm. nervous system uh, output. And then if I haven't said sleep, you know, focus on your sleep. Excellent. And if you can do those things, um, you're going to be able to boost your testosterone levels to your greatest ability possible. And then after that, you say, hey, I did everything I can. My body is healthy, yet I'm at the age now or particular point in my life where I need to supplement a little bit. Dr. Gabral, do you recommend when people, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming there's already a, a selection bias when people come see you, but do you recommend to people testing based off of symptoms right out the gates or is there like a, like these are the ones I recommend to everybody to get started with? So we always recommend something called a big five lab test. Like if you can run those, everyone should run it once a year because if you go by symptoms alone, it's not going to be fast enough to, for you to catch what the underlying root causes are that eventually lead to disease. Some people feel totally fine. Then they go to their PCP and they're like, oh, white blood cells are a 300. Like that's a problem. Mm. You know, what was going on there? So the big five are looking at your 
uh, heavy metals and minerals, your gut function, vitamin levels. So you just know, like, do you need these? Yes or no. Your omega-6 to omega-3 levels, we should run that lab. If we haven't run that lab yet, just to know, like, hey, if you're not using any omega-3 supplementation, great. Well, you may not need it, but do you know yes or no? Most people, they have no idea mm-hmm. and they do need it. And like, that's the thing is I don't, I like to just take the uh, ego out of it and just say, I don't know either. Let's go lab test. Let's check these things yes, out. You can check yeah. your food sensitivities and you can check your hormones. And then the nice thing is not everything is going to be off. So you only need to optimize the one, two or three areas that need to be optimized. Then you can retest if you choose to 12 to 16 weeks later. Now it's optimized. You're good to go. You'll yeah. feel the difference. So we've been partnered up for almost what a quarter and a half, two quarters now. And um, you have we have this great community that we're building. I believe we're over ten thousand people in the forum or approaching seven thousand somewhere yes. around there in the in the private forum. Which by the way, if the audience doesn't know, is absolutely free for you to join. It's MP Holistic Health, right? That's the name right. Of Correct. Um, Tell me a little bit about what you're seeing with our community. I mean, are, is there common themes that you're mm-hmm. seeing or is there, is there things you wish that people would ask or tell you more? Like, give me a little bit of insight on our community and what you're seeing. So one of the great things is your community is more educated than your average consumer or client. They know more about nutrition. They know more about exercise. They're more into biohacking uh, and they're more open to to doing. They're also better things. looking than most people. <laughs> <laughs> it is online, so I haven't seen as many. Um, so that that is the nice thing. So we have, we can have, well, people can enter at any level, so they shouldn't feel bad about coming in and asking a question. But we have some high level discussions in there. Uh, there are at least 7,000 people in that group, which is pretty amazing because it's only been like 10 or 12 weeks. Yeah. Um, and that our coaches and myself get in once a week. We get on there live. We're also answering questions daily. Mm-hmm. And we're trying to just be more approachable and, and uh, able to steer people in the right direction yeah. through lifestyle, what, what is called my de-stress protocol. So diet, exercise, stress reduction, toxic removal, rest, emotional balance, which is such a big part of it, uh, scientifically backed supplements, and then a success mindset, like yeah. being able to do it. One thing I want to add, uh, Dr. Cabral, is two things. One, and I've seen this so many times with clients, is someone says, I'm fine. I feel okay. Uh, but the problem is that they felt bad for so long that their mm-hmm. context of what good is or whatever is totally warped. Yeah. So then we start changing the diet and exercise. And like, oh my God, I had no idea how bad I felt before. And then two, maybe you are doing everything right. I think it's important to do tests to get a baseline to know when, well, when I felt good, these are what my levels look like. Because as you said, there's a range yes. and there is an individual variance with the ranges, maybe a little higher, maybe a little lower for you. So even if you feel no symptoms and you are healthy and you are good and you exercise, you eat right, it is nice to get a nice baseline. This is where I'm at right now when I was doing all these things. I was consistent with exercise. I was sleeping good. That way later on, if you start to feel off, you've got a great reference point that you could point to. 100%. And there is no, I'm doing everything right. It's only, Mm -hmm. are you doing everything right for you? Mm -hmm. Like So if you're following someone else's plan, it may or may not be right for you. But until you, and again, run a run the lab that you feel comfortable with, but until your numbers say, yeah, you are doing everything right, uh, I think that's a hard one because you can say, oh, I'm eating all the right foods. Okay, uh, I'll use, I'll literally go down and I'll look at people's micronutrients, forget macros, and I'll put in all the foods they're eating, everything to the last morsel. And I can tell you, and including myself, it's really hard to get 100% in every area of every yeah. vitamin and mineral you need yeah. per day. Yeah. I mean, look at all of us. I mean, we've been doing this for a very long time. We're surrounded by experts like yourself. I like to think we know what the hell we're doing. <laughs> but, mm-hmm. I mean, none of us are, are perfect, and there's tweaks that all of us yeah. can make. Well, my to tests aren't here. It's we don't know. Wish they were. You would have been yeah, last yeah, place no, for sure. Bro. Bro. Last time I wasn't. I think <laughs> I was second or first. <laughs> anyway, well, this has been awesome. Very, very educational. Um, and again, I, I recommend recommend, I implore our audience, whether you feel good or not, especially if you're, if you have, you don't feel good and you just can't figure out what's going on. Your doctor can't figure out what's going on. Like you want to find the root cause, but even if you feel good, I think it's important to get a good baseline, have that at your disposal so that if, and when something goes wrong, you can refer back and be like, this is where I was at that moment. And you know, kind of where you need to go. Do you, this might be an ignorant question, uh, because I do have lucky, I have access to you in a different way that I could literally just text you, but do you, have you structured it with like different types of packages where you have like, you know, we recommend these tests and if you do, and you should do it, do your stuff and then retest again. Like, oh, if someone actually scheduled out like their year of testing or something like that, do you, or do you just yeah. do it by, okay, you do. Well, no, it, it really depends on like where the person's at. And obviously um, there are 
price ranges that people want to be in. Yeah. So what we try to do is all the things that would be fairly expensive, like all of your consultations, all of those things, we include them with the lab. So like this lab you just ran here today, this is called the stress, mood, and metabolism lab. So it literally looks at stress, mood, and overall, overall metabolism. So when you run this lab, you get a 30 minute call with one of my team members that's going to read your results, just like I did, make sure that you understand them. They're going to listen to your story and they're going to help you put together a plan, just basically like we did here today. Yeah. And then you can choose to then run additional labs if you want. They're basically a la carte. So all of my labs are at stephencabral.com forward slash labs. But this lab is at stephencabral.com forward slash MP. And what we want to do is, because we've done this before, is something just special for your community. And so this lab, though, is going to be one that you're going to be able to do what basically Sal said. You're going to be able to run this once a year or when you're filling off or even a follow-up with just your testosterone as needed. Oh. So the big five is everything. But if you want to pull them out, you can. Maybe you just want to look at gut function. Or maybe you just want to look at food sensitivities. Or you want to look at the heavy metals. Or you just want to look at hormones. You can do any particular lab you want without having to go to your doctor and request this. And the nice thing is we sign off uh, on this lab for you to be able to run it. The lab gets shipped to your house. You ship it back to the lab, so it's an outside lab. They run it. We get the results. We go through it, and cool. that's that. And that's stephencabral.com forward slash MP. MP. Stephen spelled with a PH. Correct. Excellent. Thanks again. Yeah, Been I appreciate awesome. it. This was yeah, great. Thanks. Good time. It's fun. This one's really important, and that is to phase your training. If somebody trains for a full year doing a bench press, and they're always aiming for five reps, if you compared that person to a person who did bench press where they did three or four weeks of five reps, but then they did three or four weeks of 12 reps and then three or four weeks of, let's say, 15 to 20 reps, and then they'll throw in some supersets. At the end of that year, you're going to see more consistent progress from the person who's moving in and out and less injury. That's another thing. You'll see less injury as well.